Um, so tonight we have Matias Del Campo. Matias is a registered architect, designer, and educator. He's also an associate professor at the Taubman College for Architecture and Urban Planning, so our neighbor just down the road, um, and director of AR2IL, the Art Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at University of Michigan. He conducts research on advanced design methods in architecture, primarily through application of artificial intelligence techniques in collaboration with the Computer Science Department and Michigan Robotics, um, uh, of which he's also an affiliated faculty member. Matias Del Campo is the co-founder of the Architectural Practice SPAN, S-B-A-N. Their award-winning architectural designs are informed by advanced geometry, computational methodologies, and philosophical inquiry. Uh, and then there's an incredible roster of achievements, including uh, design of the Austrian Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai World Expo, uh, the, robot, the Robot Garden at the Ford Robotics Building. Um, Span's work was also featured in the Venice Biennale in 2012 and 2021, Archilab 2013, and the Architecture Biennale in Vienna and Buenos Aires in 2019. Um, Mateus uh, was also awarded the Accelerate at CERN Fellowship, which sounds really interesting. Um, the AIA Studio Prize is elected to the Board of Governors at Acadia and a IJAC, which is the International Journal of Architectural Computing. Um, in 2013, SPAN expanded its operations to Shanghai, China, where practice, his practice is currently working on building projects at various scales. Uh, Mateus also earned his Master of Architecture from the Applied University of Applied Arts in Vienna and PhD from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology uh, in Melbourne, which is how we crossed paths um, in that program. So really excited for, and he has a brand new book out. So have a look at this. Um, finally arrived after lots of delays with, with the regular supply chain issues. So check that out. And please help me welcome Matthias Del Campo. Uh, thank you so much, Gretchen, for the generous introduction. Um, reminds me, I probably have to shorten that Vita a little bit. Um, so I'm really happy to be here uh, for a variety of reasons. I'm a huge admirer of the school in general and its history. Um, there's like so many incredible people and names uh, of, of amazing heroes for me that uh, were part of the school, whether it's Charles and Raheem, Sunny Rashid, Carl Shu, Jesse Rice, Daniel Liebeskind, and among those, also my, my step-grandfather, Leon Yulkowski, who actually graduated from this school. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the, the content of the book and some of the ways that how we, who, or how I got to some of the thoughts within it. So the basis of the lecture is the book Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence. We've just published oral editions very, fairly recently. And it starts with the chapter, this building does not exist, um, and tries rather to, instead of creating something like a manual uh, or uh, a technical manual, it's rather um, a contemplation about the discursive and theoretical aspects that come along once we start using AI in architectural design. Uh, the book is based on a series of papers that are published between 2019 and 2000, uh, no, 2018 and 2020, uh, which interrogated ideas about how to, you know, first of all, understanding how machines learn and how we are actually changing from a system that goes from um, expert systems to um, learning systems, which is a huge change in the way how we operate as architects and designers. And also interesting for me is that it is an, an, an all-encompassing all -encompassing, uh, paradigmatic shift. Uh, AI is part of our everyday life entirely today already. It's not science fiction. It's, uh, you know, we just were talking before about Tesla and the cars. They're based on machine vision processes that understand uh, what is the next car in front of it or wh who's a pedestrian and so on. When you, for example, open your phone and it recognizes your face in order to, to open the phone for you, that's facial recognition systems. Uh, facial recognition is basically um, everywhere these days. But it also interrogates ideas of um, uh, more philosophical or theoretical aspects such as estrangement and defamiliarization as an, as an area of interrogation for artistic production. It's already very much accepted in, in the arts and it seems that it's also catching up in the architecture discipline. 
So um, um, it, it tries to understand why it, uh, it creates these strange morphologies that we see. It tries to understand whether machines can plan in general. Yeah? Do they have a concept of planning? as we architects do. And ultimately, the book ends uh, with um, um, interrogation of the political dimension uh, of AI, the ethical dimension of AI. Like, how, what does it mean for us as architects to create um, data sets that hopefully can um, not entirely avoid, but at least um, to a certain extent help with avoiding uh, racial bias um, and cultural bias, which is a phenomenon that we're seeing increasingly in, in work getting done these days. Uh, I would like to thank Mario Carpo for the preface of the book. He wrote like, really a fantastic preface um, where he tried to, understand, to unpack how SPAN is basically using these methodologies that are described in the book to understand uh, a, a variety of different possible ways to go in regards of designing architecture. And um, neural architecture is the field of architecture that is pr primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of arti artificial neural networks, ANNs, as a method of designing architecture. ANNs can be described in short as a sequence of mathematical algorithms that are capable of registering latent correlations in a set of data. In this lecture, I present an attempt to utilize deep learning and machine learning to capture the salient features of existing architecture in order to interrogate this data for the underlying architectural qualities. What is meant by underlying architectural qualities? The rational explanation would include aspects such as spatial layout, sectional distribution of volumes, the dialogue with its environment, volumetric balance, the material qualities of the design, the structural properties, and so on and so forth. All of these things can be explored with the use of, uh, of machine learning. However, the ambition of the pro projects in this lecture maintains that architecture is more than just uh, an assemblage of rational properties. This might explain the obsession with neural art, which represents an excellent mirror of our contemporary age, particularly regarding our shared agency with quasi-intelligent machines. Can architecture, do, can architecture do the same? Can neural networks help interrogate the latent layers within the, logic, the geological deposits of the history of the architecture discipline, and then assemble those found features into new projects, or new designs, or unseen designs? What is the context of which this idea uh, emerged from? And before we go deeper into this question, the first question is why use AI at all? In short, it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. You might have seen videos like this before. This is the way how cars were made until the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and, and, and a mass of experts floating around parts of a car and basically welding them together with an expertise that they have won over maybe decades working on the assembly line. Everyone has a specialized task and needs to focus to create those pieces that are there. Of course, this is a very time-consuming and expensive way of doing cars. And around 1967, no, actually exactly 1967, uh, the first robot was used uh, in an assembly line by General Motors in one of the New Jersey plants. It was the Unimate robot uh, that basically automatized some of these processes. And I think you probably have seen these videos before uh, of assembly lines as we... Let me see if I can put the volume a bit down here. So what, what happens here is that a robot gets trained to weld specific parts of the car, right? So every single model, that, 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 uh, new model, uh, a person needs to train a robot, where are the welding points of that car? Where have, do I need to weld this model? And, and it can repeat that process, of course, endlessly, or as long as the robot can work, let's say. Um, and it's going to be always the same points. Now, the problem is, if you have to produce a new car, a new model, yeah, it will, uh, you need to retrain the robot. And anyone of you who has worked with a robot already has seen the pendant that the robot has that allows you to move the robot in a particular direction and give it certain commands. Now, this training, of course, is costly, it's time-consuming, and, and it's not very flexible because it can only reproduce what it learned once. On the other hand, it is interesting that the car industry has been collecting welding points 
for the last 50 plus years. So it's an enormous data set, yeah, which allows us basically to take those data sets and train a robot not to understand particular specific points of a specific car model to weld, but to understand what is welding and what is good welding. Yeah? So you can take then something like machine vision and a model comes along that assembly line, the robot was not trained by a human but by, by this data set and it will immediately understand I have to weld here, here, here and here to make a good connection. And the next car that comes along can be a completely different model, it doesn't matter because it learned what welding is instead of specific points in space. So this is what, uh, what is interesting in this sort of uh, getting data, enormous amounts of data, and then training a machine to understand how to solve particular problems. So it learns that. Another area of consideration is the rise of neural art. And here we are moving now from the practical application in a factory to the application in the arts. You might have seen this portrait before. It's the portrait of Edmond de Bellamy, which was created by a Paris-based art collective Obvious in 2018. Uh, it immediately became famous because it sold for almost half a million dollars at Christie's. And there was, of course, immediately also questions about what does it mean that a machine creates this piece of art? Or did really the machine create the piece of art? Yeah? Um, by the way, the name, um, Edmond de Bellamy is obviously a hint uh, towards the name of the inventor of the generative adversarial network, the GAN, uh, Ian Goodfellow. Uh, Goodfellow, Bellamy. Yeah. Um, but um, the, the main questions that came up after this was sold was, who has the agency here? Who's the author of this piece? Yeah. Um, because the question here is, is the authorship in the art collective that came up with the idea of using AI to create a piece of art? Or is it the programmer who actually programmed the algorithm that created the piece of art? Or is, it, is the agency or the authorship in the thousands of painters and artists who are present in the data set used to create this piece of art? It's completely unclear. Yeah? The rise of neural art became very visible after 2018 with artists such as Sofia Crespo, Mario Klingemann, Memo Acton. They all embraced the use of AI as a legitimate form of artistic production or artistic expression rather. And it cannot be reduced to the visual arts alone. Musicians, which call themselves neuron musicians such as Holy Herndon, Arca, Yacht, Databots, use AI to make their music. And one of the earliest adopters of neural networks or AI in general to create art is actually literature. And around the same time, we were experimenting around with creating our own data sets. So we, this example here is based on a data set of Gothic architecture that we put together in 2018 to create a so-called latent walk. And the latent walk basically takes existing data points, images of Gothic architecture that exists, and interpolates between uh, those points. But it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a morphing. Yeah? There's other information present here. The machine starts to learn features and starts to assemble them together. Oh, by the way, uh, talking about the creation of data sets, when we started doing this first data set, I actually, uh, I don't know if you know the term scraping. So scraping basically is an automated method of collecting images from the internet with specific labels. Labels, basically names of the files, right? And my first attempt was, uh, I, I looked for goth. And you can imagine what kind of data set I got at the end. It was not really that useful. Uh, but um, I, I learned also that manu you have to manually go in there and then start cleaning up and really be a little bit cleverer with how to put things together. So in short, AI doesn't do anything automatically. Yeah. But what is the architect's role in a context where the, the sole authorship is not in the human anymore, but when agency is shared? Um, these are a couple of examples of uh, first attempts to do plans and sections using uh, neural style transferring, uh, which was a very exciting method for us. Again, making data sets of thousands of sec sections. In this case, it was, as, it was sections of libraries uh, or, or thousands of plans, and then using uh, a method called StyleGun, in this case StyleGun2, to generate new, new plans and new sections out of this context, out of this content. Yeah? Uh, I want to point out actually that they look like plans and they look like sections, but if you look closer into them, you will figure out that they make no sense whatsoever. And that has to do with the fact that very rarely this, those data sets contain semantic information of what is what, what is a sleeping room, what is a living room, and so on, what is a library. 
<clears throat> Another theoretical aspect discussed in the book is the idea of estrangement and defamiliarization. This is something that goes back to Viktor Schlofsky, uh, Bert Brecht, and Sigmund Freud. Um, and defamiliarization or ostranenie is, a, is an area of interrogation that basically describes um, an artistic method that provokes the audience with imagery depicting everyday things in unfamiliar or strange ways. And this actually heightens the attention. This is basically something that was uh, suggested by Viktor Shlovsky, a Russian formalist, in, in 1917 in an article called Art is Technique. Um, and the goal was to provide the audience with the opportunity to gain new perspectives and observe the world through a different lens, through techniques that introduce abstraction into the aesthetics of everyday life. Uh, and this concept actually influenced 20th century art and theory, things like Dada, postmodernism, epic theater, science fiction, uh, and philosophy. Yeah? And uh, it has been more recently also used in techniques such as culture jamming. There's a longer history to the idea of estrangement and defamiliarization. Uh, just briefly going to mention that it is present in the work of, of, of Hegel. Marx talked about this. I mentioned already Viktor Shlovsky. And Bertolt Brecht, who really used it extensively in his theater work, um, things like Muta Courage or um, the Gute Mensch von Sichuan, uh, used these methods in their stage plays to create a certain amount of uh, uh, abstraction within what the observer of the piece of theater is actually looking at. So for example, uh, his stages sometimes had one realistic uh, prop, like the, ca the carriage of Muta Courage, and then the rest of the stage was pretty much empty and showed like the mechanism of the theater, of the stage, showing that this whole thing is an illusion. Yeah? Or actually, he didn't want to create an illusion. He wanted rather the people to focus on the text. And uh, I want to, of course, you, you need to mention um, Sigmund Freud when it is about estrangement and things like that. He wrote, he wrote a really interesting essay called Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny, where Freud also in, uh, identified that um, the uncanny is deeply rooted in what is known to individuals as common or familiar. Yeah? Deviations from the familiar, defamiliarization, aspects of life, results in emotional responses uh, in the observer. And I think that's uh, what makes a lot of the imagery that we've seen from generated through AI so attractive and so interesting to us because they have elements that are familiar, but on the other side have elements that are really weird and strange and different. This is one of my favorite images that I generated over summer using a diffusion model, uh, you've probably heard about Midjourney. I mean, everyone has heard about Midjourney by now. And the interesting thing for me is if you observe this image, there are features in there that we as architects immediately recognize. Okay, we see like there's bands of windows, there's glazing going on, there's sharp corners going on, there's like a little bit of cantilevering going on. So these are all features that are familiar to us. So we recognize this as being a building. But at the same time, there are strange things going on, like what's happening on the ground here? How, what's the ground condition here? How does it touch the ground? Is it emerging from the ground? Is it carved from a piece of rock? We don't know. And the same happens also on the sea, in, the, on, in the roof line. Yeah? It has this sort of very strange roof line. It looks natural somehow, but it's not really natural. So there's like all these contradictions and discussions that you can have about this image, about whether it is somehow carved out of a piece of rock or is it just wrongly casted in in, in, in concrete. So what I'm trying to say here is this combination, this seamless combination between features that we recognize immediately as sort of correct architectural features and at the same time having these moments where you, you feel provoked uh, in terms of the defamiliarized elements of a house. Yeah? So one of the biggest boldest statements in the book is basically that this is the first genuinely 21st century design method. Hear me out, hear me out. I mean, there's, there's some reasons for this, yeah? Um, so if you think about computational design in the last 22 years, yeah? Uh, all of those methods have already been around in the late 90s, yeah? So things like parametric modeling, agent-based modeling, scripting, versioning, blobs, folds, et cetera, et cetera. They're all things that were present in the, in the late 90s and were refined and perfected throughout uh, the, uh, the, the, the first decades of the 20th, uh, 20th, uh, 21st century. But what we see here now happening, neural architecture is a new paradigm, yeah? not only intellectually and culturally, but also technically, because what we see today was not even yet possible a decade ago. Yeah? 
And let me give you some examples to somehow give them a bit of a, of a base. Uh, one of those being the robot garden uh, that um, Gretchen mentioned in the introduction. The robot garden was a commission uh, by uh, the Robotics Institute of the University of Michigan who uh, uh, started building a new building a couple of years ago and wanted to have a testing ground for their, for their robots just next to the new building. Um, and because the, they knew that we are working on using machine vision methods that come from the robotics department to create architecture or designs, they asked us whether we want to use these methods to create the garden. Uh, so we ended up with one of their uh, PhD students, Alexandra Carlson, and developed like a whole set of, of um, ideas of how we can basically fulfill the requirements that they have to the garden on this small lens-shaped site. So we used a, a combination of different methods. We used deep trimming, we used um, a, a neural style transfer, and we used 2D to 3D style transferring. And what this means a little bit in you know, terms that you might heard or not before, is that we created a huge data set of satellite images of different ground conditions, because that's what they wanted. Uh, the reason why they needed different ground conditions is that uh, they're testing on this specific site something called the last 100 step problem. And the last 100 step problem basically says that if you want to have robots deliver goods to your door from a car or from a, from a truck, it has to overcome a variety of different obstacles, and they're often very different. So a way to a house can be gravel or concrete or plaster, or it can be, it can be grass. Yeah? So there's like different ground conditions that a robot has to understand how to adapt to. And then one of the hardest things is that uh, steps might be different on different house entrances. So one of the requirements was also to create steps with a variety of different lengths and heights. Yeah? <clears throat> To achieve the steps, actually in the stairs, we created a data set of hundreds of uh, satellite images of stairs, uh, from fountains, for example, or monuments, and so on, uh, and then used deep dreaming to see if we can get, come up with something that makes sense in this, in this model. I have to say that one thing we learned over the several years that we're working now with AI is that regardless of what you get out of AI these days, you still has to put a, a lot of human work in there to really make it work. It might change in the upcoming years, but at the moment it's still something that needs time and effort. I got this video recently from, uh, from the Robotics Institute, um, which replaced another video that I had in my lecture because I really am fascinated with the way how machines see the world. This very strange and weird perception of our environment, of, f of physics, of materials, uh, so that's, this is how they see the robot garden. Yeah? It's this LiDAR imagery, light and, and, and range detection that allows them to perceive the depth and dimension of where they have to walk through. Yeah? And funny enough, also because of the way how they do it, everything that makes shadows, for them, what is behind the shadow is invisible. Yeah? So um, uh, I'm somehow obsessed with this vision of the world. Uh, just a quick uh, image of the data set with the satellite images. Uh, this is a small portion. Uh, in order to get any form of working a neural network application, you need at least 1,500 images. And this is the bare minimum, the barest, barest minimum. Yeah? Some of the results from these uh, methods that I described before, like deep dreaming, hallucinating, and so on, sometimes they make sense, sometimes they make no sense whatsoever. Uh, this is still where you need the human, again, to, to, to somehow, the human in the loop that understands, yes, this is usable or this is not yet usable. But this might be, by the way, just an in-between step. We might go uh, as long as when we start to train machines better, they might also be able to make these decisions. I like to show this image because this is probably one of the strangest things that we got out of the process. Uh, it's full of glitches and errors, and, uh, but I like it very much because I think that's, that tells me probably more about how machines see architecture than how we see architecture. So this might be actually what they want. Uh, a couple of words about text-to-image generation. I, I already said a little bit about this, but it is a little bit more in-depth. Well, you simply type in a text prompt, and it will create images for you in around a minute. So, for instance, you might so type in... So, if like, even John Oliver talks about, about like, mid-journey, like yeah, it means that it has come entirely into the mainstream of culture production in our world. Yeah. So, um, 
One of the things I'm really fascinated about is the way how you use language to generate images with AI these days, uh, which very much reflects also on the on Wittgenstein's idea that the limits of my language means the limits of my world. So if you're good with language, you might be able to generate really interesting images. Uh, Inri, which is one of the developers of Disco Diffusion recently in a, in a panel discussion, I think at the Arcadia conference, said also something which I thought is very interesting and very true, which is if you do not have an, if you don't have an art project, you're not going to be able to, to create good images with any diffusion model. And this says a lot about this idea of the limits of my language means the limits of my world. Limits of my language means also the, your, the limits of your creative thinking. Yeah. Uh, we started using uh, text-to-image uh, um, models um, in a, a couple of years ago, before actually mid-journey and diffusion models became so popular this year, uh, with a competition entry for a high school in Shenzhen, China, where we used actually sentences that described parts of the program of the architecture, combined with some a little bit of a surreal twist in them. So things like, this gym has 2,000 square meters and has two best basketball fields and has, a changing, has changing rooms and is standing on yellow canary feet. Yeah? So when you take those, those things, they start to create really interesting images. And uh, we, we took those images, and you see this is basically a, a combination of those images, to understand how to create a 3D model out of it. It, it was divided into color patches, and those color patches using a little bit of grasshopper magic were then extruded into volumes. So this was a simple approach to that problem. Yeah? I mean, we were really at the beginning of understanding how to work with this properly. But it showed us also specific problems. Like, for example, yes, the result of what we got of this uh, attentional GAN uh, can generate the volumes, but it cannot generate the interiors. Yeah? So we had basically to, to infuse the interiors manually in this project. Uh, in the meantime, we know that we can basically con concatenate those processes. We just use two neural networks. One creates the interior, the other one creates the exterior. Uh, and of course, it, it, it's completely contradictive to, to common architectural thinking where, I mean, I was educated in, yes, you design the interior, the interior will define the exterior of your building. This does not do that, right? This is really like a combination that combines two completely different notions of how the spaces work, exterior and interior. It's rather more, sim it's more similar to a Baroque thinking of, uh, of space where you have like an exterior figure and an interior figure and a pochet in between that can be very articulated. And this is somehow coming back with this thinking here. Talking about diffusion models, uh, this was the first diffusion model I used. Um, it's called Disco Diffusion. It came to my attention in early 22, early this year, January, something around there. Um, and I actually saw it for the first time in, 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 a, in a mailing list uh, from uh, media artists. Yeah, so I, I, I'm very much looking always what artists are doing because they always figure out things earlier than architects. Yeah? And, and try to see what are they doing with this. And I tried to create this sort of endless plan that you just saw. But these diffusion models also bring something along that we as architects are very used to, which is this sort of uh, thinking in iterations. Yeah? If you think about how architects commonly work, for example, starting to create a plan, some sit down with a piece of, you know, with a piece of paper and a pen and start sketching a plan, and then another one, and then another one, and then start to iterative, iteratively improving that plan. Or like in this case, this is a, a project by Hans Holland, uh, the Saturn Tower in Vienna. Uh, these are models from 2014, uh, 2004. And it's the same thing, iteratively working on volumetric variations of that project until there's something that will provoke the, the decision to go on with it. Yeah? What diffusion models do is that they amplify that uh, extremely. Uh, I made a little calculation from, I started using Midjourney um, late April, early May, something like that. And, and in this calculation, I did this calculation a couple of months ago, from April to August, I created 75,000 images. Yeah? And I'm not even a power user. There's others who have done much more than that in the time alone. So it basically takes the idea of iteration and it really explodes it. Yeah? And it, 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 mid journey is something that is very clever, which is it, it, when you put in a prompt, it gives you four images and you can decide, you can choose which one you're going to amplify, make big, or make variations of it. Yeah? So it's very, um, 
It's very seductive. I also warn everybody, everybody right away, mid-journey is profoundly addictive. So if you start working, it is, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's so rewarding that you want to continue, continue, continue. It, it fades away after a while, just saying. Uh, maybe a quick explanation of how diffusion models operate in general, because it's really exciting. I mean, mid-journey is, is a black box. You cannot see what's happening in there, right? You cannot change the code. You cannot uh, adapt it. You cannot break it. Yeah? Others are more open. Stable diffusion, you can go in there, change the code when you have the Google call up. Um, disco diffusion, same thing. Um, but let me give you like a little bit of an historic explanation of what happened. In 2015, we had enough annotated images. And annotated images mean, uh, for example, um, an image that is connected to the information, this is a dog, this is a car, this is a chair, this is a building. Yeah? So you understand these individual parts. Somebody came up with the idea, what if we can do something like automated image captioning? Meaning that instead of just describing this is a dog or this is a car, you get a machine to describe the scene it is seeing in this image. In this case, people walking on a bridge. And it does this automatically. Yeah? Now somebody can, then came up with the idea, well, what happens if we turn this around? And we say people walking on a bridge and let the machine generate the image. Yeah? This one person was uh, Elmer Manisov and his colleagues at uh, Amazon Web Services. And they created a, a paper right away in 2016 uh, that was called uh, Generating Images from Captions with Attention. came out in 2016. And I have to say, I'm, for, for, for months already, every single time I show this, I say, and I'm sorry that I don't, don't have the next slide because I have to put in a slide with the images that they generated in 2016. Because it, there is one example, for example, that says, the prompt is um, a red elephant flying in the sky. Yeah? And then you see the image that it generated. And it's basically a blue blotch with a red blotch in there. Because the resolution was so bad at the time that you had to squint with your eyes to see, that, yeah, maybe it's an elephant. Yeah? But it somehow worked. Yeah? And what happens in this diffusion model is it takes images that are, are in the data set and that are annotated, so meaning they understand what it is, in this case, Frank Gehry's Bilbao project, and then iteratively add noise to it until it's a complete noise image, like in this case. And then they reverse the process, basically saying, okay, if I reverse it and take those pixels that are complete noise, random, uh, random noise, take the information in the prompt, and organize the pixels so that they create an image that makes sense to me. In this case, an alpine villa. Yeah? Now, an, this whole technology also opens, of course, all the doors for lazy architects. Yeah? Because you can go and say, Mies van der Rohe building, and you will get quite convincingly looking Mies van der Rohe images. This is, by the way, version two of Midjourney. Version four by now is so perfect that it creates like completely convincing images of things that it, that it knows well, which means there's tons of images of, of Mies, Mies van der Rohe in the datasets used. Just so you get the, the, the point of datasets, what that means, like with, like with any other computational process, Garbage in, garbage out. So if the data set is bad, you're not going to get good results. Or if the data set is too small, you're not going to get good results. In the case of, of Midjourney, it's using a data set called the Lion data set, which is 5.3 billion annotated image pairs, uh, image sentence pairs. That is a lot of data. And the more you have, the more precise it can actually produce the imagery. And it, it went from... I think when I, when version two was something like 230, 240 million images. To today, a couple of months later, it's 5.3 billion. At some point, we're probably gonna be able to have everything in the data set. Uh, Kyle Steinfeld, a good uh, colleague of mine, made an interesting comment asking, if I have all the images in the world in a data set, does it also mean that it eradicates bias? Yeah. And my, my answer to that is no. And there's a very simple reason for that. It, you only can have images if, you have docu if it's documented. So for example, if you think about cultures that do not have so many images, yeah, they're still going to be underrepresented in there. Yeah? So of course, the, the West will always have more pictures. We invented photography. The French did. 
Anyways, um, so uh, maybe another, a couple of other examples. A prompt like section drawing through an opera house. So of course, it can be like, okay, yes, somehow I get the feeling, I get the feeling this could be an opera, yeah? Uh, but at the same time, again, if you look closer into this, you will see that that's absolutely not an opera house. I mean, there's, it makes no sense whatsoever. I'm not saying it's senseless. I, what I'm saying here is that you can use this as an inspiration for a starting point of a project. This is a, a vehicle, a fantastic vehicle for pushing forward with design ideas. And again, this is the older version of Midjourney. The newer one generates in the meantime sections that are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful renderings. Yeah. Um, but still, you look at them and just architecturally speaking, they make no sense. But if you take that and you're like, hmm, but if I, if I turn it around or do it like this and I cut this off and I put it here, suddenly it starts to make sense. That's your human touch, so to speak, on the AI, like giving those, those things the semantic meaning they need. Also, this is going to change because data sets are increasingly getting made now that, in, that already include semantic information. And when the semantic information is there, they can really create sections of plans that make sense. But more about this a bit later. You can do also things like this. What is the most beautiful house in the world? What would an AI think is the most beautiful house in the world? So when I see this here, yeah, I'm not concerned about the future of architects. So you can do like, uh, very early on when I started working with uh, these uh, diffusion models, I, I really wanted to make these combinations that we tried before with the um, uh, attentional gun, where we combined program with something bizarre, so to speak, to see what we can do with it. And I did things like a hairy villa or Le Corbusier house made of Kobe beef or you know, new Piranesi etchings, a scaly house, a house made of feathers. Yeah? So all those things came very early on already in this work, which is, it was really fun doing this. I mean, I, I, I admit that. But the good thing is also that it inspired others to try those things. Uh, I just, when I, I was, the last two days, was, I was in Texas doing these lectures, and I uh, talked to a colleague who said when he saw the, f the house made of feathers is when, he's, when, he, when he understood that we are, we are onto something that is really interesting, yeah? And also the facade studies. Um, I think those tools are gonna become very valuable in, in even just very quickly developing design ideas. Like imagine that we're basically turning the whole system of designing around, right? I mean, until now, you, you had an idea of a project, you created a 3D model, you started to, to detail this 3D model more and more for a client, let's say, yeah? Then, then you started to create a couple of renderings, and then at the end you created a couple of money shots yeah? to go to the client and convince him about doing this. Yeah? Now we can turn this completely around. We can create the money shot first, yeah? go to the client and ask him what he likes, and he says, yeah, this is awesome, we're gonna do that, and then invest the time and money in creating a 3D model. Yeah? More variations, I'm gonna jump over a couple of those. Um, it's basically just showing this, this idea, again here, like you can go really into a lot of detail, but you can also explore very strange things, yeah? like high rises made of my mycelium or, or mushrooms, yeah? or um, rooftop remodeling in Vienna, and I showed this one already before, this, it, it's totally worth seeing that twice in a lecture. Um, but how do we really do, uh, these are all images, like how do we go and really create a project out of it? Yeah? And this is a, an attempt that we, we did uh, last year, January Center in Vienna, based on StyleGun 2. Um, what we did was create a large collection. Again, everything starts always with data set building, in, in our case. Uh, we rarely use existing data sets, by the way, because we want to avoid certain biases. Uh, so we always put the effort and time and money in doing our own data sets. So this project is the generally center in Vienna, Austria. It's a combination between a shopping mall and uh, office spaces. And we definitely wanted to see, like, how can we use brutalism in Vienna, which is not a very common uh, thing in Vienna to do, but we were curious to see if we can do it. It's right in the center of a very uh, uh, famous uh, shopping street. So first was collecting of images, again, scraping the internet, looking for brutalism imagery. Then uh, creating a latent walk, this is what you see here, this is the training process. Then we had some training results, just a bunch of them. Um, the latent walk is basically, again, the sort of interpolation between some of the training results. 
And then comes the human part, which is selecting a couple of those images from these thousands and thousands of images that it produces to create a so-called pixel projection to come up with a model. Yeah? Uh, and basically what pixel projection does is it takes the, RG, the, the in this case, the grayscale values of the image and assembles them into a 3D model in the center. Um, it, it is, it's, a, it's a combination between voxelization and then skinning the whole thing. So there's a couple of things involved here, but uh, it was quite interesting to see for us how it was able to create a model that was a convincing starting point for us in the project. So we took then that model and started to add onto it things that we needed to make this project really a working result. So this is basically the resulting model out of this. That had, but we had to add, of course, things like staircases, elevators, floor plates, all these functional elements, uh, uh, floor, floor um, window frames, glazing, all of these were things that had to be added manually after we generated the model. Yeah? Uh, but uh, again, this is all a moving target at the moment. There's several people involved in understanding how to create really 3D model data sets and how to use the models, like literally using a GAN, for example, that goes into 3D instead of using the image uh, translations only. Here you see like all the things we had to model uh, afterwards. Like uh, we, I pulled them out to make this rendering to, to show uh, how much manual work was involved still in this model. By the way, one of my biggest arguments always is that um, the obsession with 3D models in the architecture discipline is rather something new. I mean, if you think about it, we have like 35, maybe 40 years that we're really continuously making 3D models. And it's, it's sometimes I'm thinking we're a, bit, we're a little bit spoiled, yeah? Because basically speaking, one of the biggest achievements of architecture, of historically seen for me, is the Albertian paradigm, where somebody basically defined that we as architects should be able to think about something in 3D in our head, being able to project it onto a two-dimensional surface in terms of plans and sections, and then build that in one-to-one -one scale back again. So unfold it from 2D into 3D again. This is an amazing intellectual achievement. Yeah? And whenever I go to a lecture and somebody asks me, when are we going to be able to do AI in 3D? It's like, is this really so important? I don't know. I think there we have, there's other things that are more interesting. A similar project, a similar concept. Um, this is the Deep House, also using StyleGun 2. Uh, this is a, a, a fun project. Um, an, an Austrian neurologist approached us because he saw some of the images we're doing and he read that we're using basically methods that are, have their origin in neuroscience uh, to create all this work that you saw now in the lecture. Yeah? And he said, okay, we have, I have a site um, in, on the border between Salzburg and Tirol in Austria and he wants to build a, sort of a weekend house for them, for the family there. But, and he wants us to do it, but it has to be a mid-century modern house. That was his rule, right? So we basically, again, created this data set of a couple of thousand of facades for mid-century modern projects. Same thing as before, a latent walk, training the, the, the network to do it, latent walk through the data set, selecting a couple of images that we can use basically then in a pixel projection to put it back together. And the beautiful thing in this case is that what started before with the general center where it started to create parts of the interior worked so much better with this, uh, in this, um, in this uh, attempt to use it. Yeah. And meaning that all the little bits and pieces and strange elements that the, the process created were useful to us in, in a programmatic sense. Uh, they became the kitchen or the, or the fireplace or the sleeping rooms and so on and so forth. The ceiling is also absolutely gorgeous. So this, in this case, we had to do way less work manually already to get to a good result. And this is, of course, what we we're trying to achieve now is understanding how we can use this uh, on the one side as a design method for, for any sort of architectural problem, but at the same time understanding how these estranged, defamiliarized elements inform the design further, furthermore along the line. Okay, so this is basically was about the examples uh, of things that we've been doing recently using a variety of AI methods. Um, and, and I didn't even show we have like an, an entire uh, generative adversarial network uh, in 3D that also works already on a primitive level because one of the problems we have, and this is where our friends from computer science help us and also, also robotics, is that once you move from 2D, from pixels to 3D, uh, to CV points, 
the calculation power needed is exponentially goes up, uh, which means you cannot have this, this high resolution. It's, it's the 90s all over again. Yeah? So um, uh, this is something that we are working on, how to solve it. Apart from these projects, there's other activities that I've tried to, to push forward and to do, like for example, the Neural Architecture Group, uh, which was founded together with Daniel Bolochan, Sandra Manninger, and Emmanuel Co. We have quasi-regular meetings online. It started actually during the pandemic. We met like uh, every couple of weeks to this debate where, where is the project right now, what are they doing, what, we are, do what are we doing, and discuss uh, also the intellectual frame around it. And um, I also created the AIarchitects.org website, which collects a variety of different positions uh, on, on, the, on using AI in architecture. So if you go there, we are, we are continuously adding more people to this, yeah? um, um, that, that show their idea and their project. And I have to say that the whole work with computer science and robotics started more or less like a guerrilla action. So it was like very covert and you know, the, the, we were talking to them, but it was nothing official, so to speak. But uh, um, early last year, uh, January, February, something like this, uh, we founded the, the ARI laboratory at Taubman College to have really more like an institutionalized element, uh, add an institutionalized element to this research, make it more clear like who are, whose agenda it is and how different people are involved. It's a completely interdisciplinary laboratory, so there's people involved from architecture, computer science, robotics, and data science. Yeah? And um, it's students, uh, partially it's, it's, it's um, graded students, PhD students that are all working on a variety of projects there. Uh, and the ARI laboratory definitely is also very much interested in the practical application uh, of AI and architecture. That is very visible with the data sets we're building uh, in the laboratory, which one is called the Common House Dataset, which is a collection of annotated um, apartment plans from all over the world, where we also have people from all over the world annotating them. And annotating means that it contains the semantic information. So it, it, with this data set, a neural network would understand what a living room is or what a toilet is. Yeah? And thus can start generatively creating plans. And uh, one of our goals, and this was, would be beautiful if this works, is that, uh, first of all, this is going to be public. So it's, it's, it's public domain, everyone can use it, it's open source. It's not finished yet, that's why it's not out yet, but when we publish it, everyone can use it. And in best case, if we have enough annotated plans with enough information, we literally can improve the living conditions of millions of people. And if this works, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, and then there is a YouTube channel, so if you're interested in, like this lecture, I'm going to put it there once I get it. Uh, but there's several lectures in there, but also, for example, tutorials about how to use Python, how to use uh, the, a Google Colab, and, and, and so on. So what the GitHub repository is, how to set up Python to work on your computer on these sort of problems. There's several tutorials of that in there if you're interested. And just shamelessly, again, promoting the book. Uh, this is the Neural Architecture and Artificial Intelligence. There's also Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence that, are, that was published earlier this year, in April, I think, that was edited together with uh, Neil Leach. And in December, there's another book coming out called Architecture in the Age of Intelligent Machines, which is basically like the, if, if, if neural architecture is about the, the discursive theoretical frame of this problem that we're currently experiencing as architects, this book is the technical manual. So it has like all the mathematics and code and like all these examples in there. So it's a very pragmatic, very dry book. Yeah. And this, this I would like to say thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yes, uh, open the questions. So if anyone has questions, please, absolutely. Does anyone want to start? Yeah, just if you could maybe the discussion. So first, thanks uh, for the beautiful presentation. Um, which are the areas outside of architecture where you think this will help the most? I mean, we're already in the middle of that. Yeah, so I mean, we're talking about automated cars or there's one, one outside of architecture. 
there's so many different areas where this is already impacting right now, and some of those we don't even notice. Like, for example, when you use Amazon and it recommends books to you, it's basically a neural network learning your behavior. Yeah. So th these things are already out there. Um, they, they certainly can help a lot in things like transportation, um, ecological considerations, because it can, can optimize the use of material, for example, or, or in general, like the use of energy. Yeah. Um, it can it can help in uh, uh, overcoming economical problems. Yeah. Because it can basically predict uh, the, for example, economical developments. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tell me one area, and it probably can help. Let's say archaeology, for example. For archaeology, it's amazing, yeah, because it can basically uh, uh, exploring the data that we have of, let's say, a specific culture. Yeah, uh, it can start helping reconstructing, for example, their, their ways of living. Yeah, language, same thing. I mean, it's all over language by now already, right? Translation, uh, automated translation is all, is all neural networks. It's all AI. Um, so I think you can take any single area that you can think of, uh, and you can imp you can use AI. Probably also cooking and things like this. Yeah? So it's, it's, there's no restriction, I think. Uh, as long as you have data, you can teach a, ma a machine to learn something. That's the only thing. Where you don't have data, that's a problem. Which, which by the way, contra contradicts a little bit my, my archaeology example. Because archaeology doesn't have as much data as they would sometimes need to get a good result. Yeah? There's also the problem that there's something called the curve fitting problem, which means when you have a particular problem that you want to interrogate with a neural network, uh, it, it, it describes actually a particular curve in that data set. If you, if, you use it as a, if you imagine that as a diagram with X and Y. So when you, um, when you don't have enough data, yeah, that curve is not going to be precise enough to make a, a, a useful prediction. Yeah. For the arts, this is great. Because if you if you if you tweak that and if you if you start for example a data set of data if you if you intentionally do not good curve fitting that's where interesting things happen, but that's the artistic part. When it is about correct uh, optimization and prediction, you need as much data as you can get. Does that answer your question somehow? Thank you. Um, I when. Seeing artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think in the, the popular imagination there is, first of all, thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, in the popular imagination, you know, people's minds automatically go to doomsday, like Terminator, mm -hmm. and you've kind of demonstrated, and I think it's seeping into the mainstream a little bit more, how much of human touch is still required to even make them do the, the most like kind of rudimentary stuff. So like that threat is still very far off. Um, so I'm just curious about how like as this becomes just more interwoven into daily life and as the you know public understanding of what artificial intelligence actually is and and how it like uh, is 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 part of everyday life like. And we get further into this century. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Do, what do you anticipate in terms of trends? In terms of how it, like, the the space that it holds in the public imaginary, <laughs> and like shifting away from maybe the science fiction, like fear, uh, and yeah. what do you anticipate? Well, you see, fear mongering always sells better, right? So I think that's one of the reasons why this is getting done. I can tell you that the more I have to do with AI, the more I talk to computer scientists and roboticists about it, the more I understand what they already know for a long time, which is AI is not as intelligent as we think. Yeah? Uh, it is, I try to say that it's, it's a learning system, right? So if we can, if we can, we can optimize things with it, we can predict things with it yeah? uh, to a certain extent. And this is the interesting part for us, because we humans are, for example, not so good in predicting, right? Um, but it, can, it cannot reason. Yeah? It, it doesn't have consciousness. Um, and there's a lot of things, for example, also that we don't, like, because it's based, at least, in neural networks. Not, by the way, AI is not only neural networks. There's a variety of other schools of thinking, Bayesians, uh, statisticians, et cetera, yeah? 
Uh, and it's sometimes also a combination of the things, like for example, search algorithms online, like Google are Bayesian systems. Yeah. Um, so um, where I wanted to go with this is that um, if we stay with neural networks, there's only certain processes we understand of our, how our mind works, right? We don't know what consciousness is exactly. Yeah, we don't know uh, what even um, um, what even a, a creative thought is. We don't know how this works in our in our head. So the question, for example, where AI can be creative, and I put a lot of time and effort researching that. Yeah, uh, and I came to the conclusion conclusion that no, AI cannot be creative. Yeah, it's us interpreting the results out of neural networks creatively. We see something interesting in there, but the the, the AI doesn't know that, and he doesn't care actually. To be honest, yeah. Um, so these ideas of, of for example, um, sensibility, human sensibility, like when you as an artist create a particular sensibility, that's very interesting, right? It seems that AI is actually able to pick up on that sensibility and maybe evolve it further, yeah. Which we consider maybe as a sort of creativity, but it's not. It's not really creativity. It's not even sensibility, right? It's you again saying, "Oh, wow, that provokes me. That's interesting. That's something that I want to continue looking at." Yeah. So it has a lot to, more to do with human response than with what actually a machine is doing, and that's why also these science fiction stories come up with, right? It's, it's a it's a very old desire, by the way. There's another lecture that I give, which is which actually shows, for example, how humans had a very have a very very long uh, story in trying to imitate organic life with inorganic matter, meaning automatons and things like that. Yeah. So we we, we want to read that. We want our commander data. Yeah. We want uh, we want the, the robot from uh, from iRobot or whatever. You know. We have the desire to replicate ourselves synthetically somehow. And, and, but we're also afraid of that at the same time because it could replace us. Yeah? Well, I mean, robots, machines are definitely kind of going to replace us in certain areas, but that has been ongoing since the Industrial Revolution. It's nothing new. Yeah? And by the way, also people who, have, who are saying, like, well, we're going to lose 750 million jobs in the next couple of years to automation, that's not the right calculation. Those jobs change. It becomes something different. It's, it's going to become people annotating data sets or looking whether the data set is correct or not. You know, it's, it's just going to change into something different. It's going to open new uh, routes of jobs. Yeah. Um, practicality or feasibility aside, what's your, what's your holy grail for a tool that you would love to work with? You say, oh, I, I wish I had a machine that did this. Oof. I wish I had a machine that teaches my students. <laughs> 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 well, there's actually uh, jokes, about, uh, jokes aside, yeah. Um, I, I realize it's a hard question. But... It's a hard question, yeah. Because, I mean, there's, there's so many areas that are amazing to, in, in terms of what they can do, like I mean, one certainly. If, if a, well, it's again a practical thing that I wanted to say. Maybe it's not the, what what you're what you're asking here, because I was thinking about. I wish I had a machine that basically figures out whether whether my project is up to code, so I don't have to care about that. Yeah, something that opens, yeah, that things that open up um, more time for me to be creative, so to speak. Yeah, where I don't have to care like oh how I'm gonna pay that rent now the next month. So if if we come. By the way, there's like in, in the last chapter where I talk about the politics of AI, that's exactly one of the things I talk about is that if we really go for things like a universal basic income, yeah, uh, it allows you know, human creativity to be explored in a, in, a, in a different way because there's no necessity anymore to, to get like a basic form of uh, job, right? Uh, which is going to be very interesting because what's going to happen, in my opinion, is that um, handmade things are going to make a huge Come back, yeah, because if you have automation that can basically create everything we need, yeah, suddenly uh, or an, or an architecture office that uses AI to create the most amazing buildings, it's all automated, right? I, I see that totally coming that there's going to be architecture offices that are going to be specialized in making everything by hand, like their plants are going to be ink, their models are going to be base wood, yeah, and they're going to be made by hand, and you know, you see the blood on the model because somebody cut himself. And like, you know, this sort of very human part of it is becoming, it's going to become very valuable. Yeah, um, but this doesn't answer your question. I'm just rambling. Yeah. yeah. 
Hi. Ah, sorry. No problem. What, what, are, what would be ways to kind of like contribute to adding data or and annotating data that, that is not available right now? Like ah, what are, yeah. would be the ways to kind yeah. of like contribute to that? That's a very interesting question. Uh, so first of all, it's possible to synthetically augment data sets. Yeah? So, and we have done this also before. Um, for example, when you collect, uh, let's say you want to make a data set of Barragan buildings. Yeah? There's only a limited set of them, or any other architect, just to a name. Yeah? There's only a limited set of them. And there's rarely architects that have done more than 1,500 buildings. Right? So um, you can take those images, for example, or plans of Barragan, and then you do the following. You get them into Photoshop, it's a super simple thing. You get them into Photoshop, there's also automated processes in Photoshop, right? You can record actions. And you do things like flip it upside down, flip it to the side, cut it up into 10 other images, yeah? And you add all of those to the data set. So this is basically um, synthetically augmenting the data set. And this is very common. Like all the guys in computer science do it, yeah, with the data they get. Because it's not so much about individual different projects. It's about the machine learning, the features in the images. Yeah? So if, if, if you have a paragon that is this way and this way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to learn twice the corners, the columns, the lines in it, and so on. Yeah? And when they're a little bit different, that already helps it to learn that and then to replicate it uh, uh, generatively. Does that answer your question? Yeah. question is about um, what you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture where biases affect the outcome. How are you uh, addressing that moving forward like uh, with, with uh, actual human interaction? That's a very, very good question. Uh, and I have to say that um, we're trying to address that with the work we do in the lab. Uh, by uh, diversifying the people involved, first of all, right? So because the problem with data sets that are getting used today is that they were primarily annotated by a very small group of people in Northern California, <laughs> yeah? So Bay Area, that's where these annotations happened. So there's, there's a heavy bias towards Western. Western culture, Western architecture, Western clothing styles, uh, and so on and so on and so on. But if you, if, if you try to diversify it, it means, and we have the tools to do that, the internet is the best thing ever to do this. You just address people all around the globe to help in the annotation process. Yeah? <coughs> We're trying to do this. Um, it's not always super successful because it also, for example, depends on the funding that you have. Because for example, we want, if, if we can, we want to pay people. We also notice, for example, that um, crowdsourcing does not work that well in architecture because architects don't want to share stuff. Yeah. So um, it's going to be a long-term project, what you're asking for, but it's necessary that we do it because if we don't do it now, it's going to be too late. That's, it's going to be manifested in the data set, and when you have, like, I don't know, 500 million architecture images annotated, no one's going to do the work to go through them again. <coughs> it costs too much. It costs too much. Does that answer your question somehow? I mean, this is a long question because uh, the whole ethical implication of AI is, is, has a lot of room to talk about, especially in architecture. I was just wondering about language, like the translational aspect of it being word searches in English and then that being translated into, into things that have already been tagged in English. And it, like, is there another, is there a translational process of other languages in this? And, and how would that impact? Because like uh, this idea of changing, translating one word through multiple different languages, you might end up with something completely different than where you started. And I'm yep. just curious how, is, it, is English just the basic uh, format or, or does that play into it? I th I'm, honestly, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, whether it is an automated translation process or the data set was trained in different languages, which is also possible. So I, I don't know exactly what the, what's the case here. Ideally, it would be really that it's trained on different languages because then you probably get better results because you can always have translation errors, which then would 
produce a different or not so good outcome. So, but what I notice is that um, things like mid-journey, like diff diffusion models, have become increasingly better in using different languages. So you can, you can you know, type in a sentence in French or Spanish or Russian or Chinese, yeah? and you get really good results. But they're also, funny enough, uh, I remember that Andrew Cutlass made an interesting experiment. He, he used a sentence in English describing a temple in Kyoto and used the same, uh, the same example in Japanese uh, describing the same temple, and the images were very different. So cultural backgrounds really are influential in there. Yeah. And then to think about the hybridizations, you know, across or between those two. Yeah. It's just interesting. Maybe one more thing to add, to, to add because you remember that I said that it starts all with a, with a um, noise image. Yeah. And because it's each, each time a new and different noise image, if you even use the same sentence in mid-journey or any diffusion model, it will create different images every single time. Interesting. Can I do two? Can I do two questions? Okay. Um, I was wondering if in your community, I, I'm super inspired by your, also your, the group that you put together and um, the, your discussions around aesthetics and value and is there like when you showed the example of the 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 most beautiful house right yeah. there's like how, how how can beauty be defined can beauty be um measured um and how how do you and your um colleagues think about it so we just had two weeks ago the, the Neural Architecture Symposium at Taubman College where some of those people who I showed of the Neural Architecture Group and others came together to discuss exactly that. And um, I mean, it's always a, it's always a little bit um, problematic when you think about encapsulating beauty in either way. Yeah? And also the question is always what value does have beauty have? In that, I mean, this is more like a, a, a joke for me, like the most beautiful house in the world, right? But, uh, but I understand that there's, of course, an, an aesthetical consideration, right? Because what we all observed in the group was that uh, certain, uh, certain diffusion models uh, can generate imagery that is, that is so different of things that we know already as architecture, but still so recognizable as architecture. And that is profoundly interesting because it actually probably allows us to explore an aesthetical condition that is different to what we know, it, it might not be even be new, yeah, but it's different, yeah, but still produce something that has architectural properties and values and qualities and so on, right? So um, we, we have been debating whether, whether these neural networks can really create a new aesthetic for years now. We have not come to a conclusion yet, but my, my personal opinion is that it certainly pushes us as humans to consider that there is a possible other aesthetic that actually emerges from AI into our aesthetic understanding. And I think that's very exciting. So, yeah, <laughs> I think there's, there's the possibility that it, it really is creating an aesthetic that we don't know yet, which is absolutely fantastic. And I won't, we won't keep you too much longer, but I just, I, my very super quick experiments with mid-journey, that's immediately what I, what I came to is that there is such a strong aesthetic that's associated with it, right? So yeah. um, I guess the more, the more it develops, either I wonder, will that, will that develop even more specifically to that particular mid-journey, or, or will, there, will it start to bifurcate? I think it's bifurcating already. I mean, the, the thing with the newest version of Midjourney, which came out two weeks ago or so, is that um, they're obviously really trying to push it more towards realism, and because of that, uh, and perfection, and because of that, it's doing less and less mistakes, but the mistakes are exactly what makes it interesting. So uh, I have actually the, uh, another slide that was not in here, because that most beautiful house was from April, and I did the same experiment a couple of days ago with the new version. And those houses are horrendous. Like, I mean, this one was really fun in comparison. At least it was fun, yeah? But these new ones look really like, like really mediocre Victorian houses when you ask the most beautiful house in the world. So it's, it's, it's gone. Yeah. 
Yeah? And I've seen already like a really interesting tendency in the last couple of weeks of people posting images uh, from a journey that they made like half a year ago. So everyone is obviously noticing that it's not developing in a direction that is interesting for what we are trying to achieve artistically or aesthetically. So we need to actually either post older pictures or use the older version. All right, I guess if that's all the questions, then we'll go. Oh. Yeah, sure. What's causing that? Sorry? What's causing that with the update? Why did they do that? Uh, popular demand. There's obviously not that many people interested in getting weird stuff out of it. <laughs> so I think that it's, I'm sure that the developers of Midjourney, they just look statistically what people are doing. Yeah, that's, you can easily statistically interrogate the results because they're all public. And then they figure out, okay, there's a trend going in that direction, so let's push them the software in that direction. That's sad. Yeah. <laughs> that's like really yeah. sad. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thanks for having me.